and welcome to Mascot Month. Super Mario might as well be a bloody printer with how much money he's made over the years. Every bloody game console has always wanted the equivalent to Mario because Mario, when he's on a console, sells that bloody console. And in the 1980s, Sega tried to create one such mascot to sell its Sega Master System. The Sega Master System was actually a development of a number of earlier consoles, and sadly, its attempt at creating a Mario clone didn't succeed all that well as the Master System flopped in North America. But one good thing, at least, is that it was fairly successful in both Brazil and a number of European countries. So what was this mascot that was created to try to take down the great God Emperor Mario? Well, it was Alex Kidd. Alex Kidd is a fairly interesting mascot because he was supposed to be the poster child for Sega, but as time went on, he would be forgotten, mainly in the face of Mr. Needle Mouse's greater popularity. So who was Alex Kidd, and why was he forgotten? Well, let's take a look at the game and see just why. When I first heard of this game, I thought it would be great. Like Super Mario Brothers, but more advanced. And when you actually read about the game, it sounds great. Better than NES graphics, pilotable vehicles, and an item shop? Sadly, when you actually play the game itself, one quickly finds that all of these elements are poorly implemented. So what do we have here in terms of fundamentals at least? The graphics look rather good, and the game is fairly well detailed. However, the level design leaves many things to be desired. In the first level in particular, it is far more difficult than it should be, as it is this vertical thing that really makes navigation a bit more difficult than one would expect from level bloody one. The enemies are on different planes from you, and it's hard not to take a hit. And of course, it's a one-hit death. Why wouldn't it be? And really, the levels don't get all that much better as the game goes on. The levels in old SMB felt fairly fair. These just feel like a Yzmir damned gauntlet of horror. This of course gets into the gameplay, and really, this is the game's major failing point. The gameplay sucks. Do you hear that? I think that's the sound of Sega Master System fans powering up their light phasers! Alright, so in SMB, you jump on enemies' heads, and it's all great fun. Here, you punch things with your radically oversized hand, and if you try and jump on their heads, of course, you die. So that means you have to be on the same plane as your enemy to actually attack them. This is bloody horrible and makes that first damn level that much more annoying. But it gets worse, lads and lasses. I don't know what in them rice balls he's shoving in his face, but they seem to have made him rather, shall we say, dense, as he has absolutely no hang time in the air when he jumps. When you jump, you are immediately brought back to the loving embrace of the Earth. Precision jumps are also an exercise in frustration as well, as you will regularly slide off of platforms or else get killed by that lack of hang time. This is what I like to call a 30 second game, meaning that it's a game that within 30 seconds you can be booted back to the menu because of many, many bullshite deaths. Oh, but it gets even better. You see, Mario had to face off against, spoiler alert, fake Bowsers. And what you did in that game is run and hit an axe, and Bowser would then fall into some lava. Simple, right? Well, that was far too mainstream for the devs of Alex Kidd. Rather, here you play Rock, Paper, Scissors. Or Jankin, as they call it in-game. You know that game that nobody as a kid actually liked playing? Yeah, well, it's a key element of this game. You have to do this for almost all the bloody boss fights, and is as boring and as dull as it sounds. But then, sometimes, this happens. Shit. You gotta be fucking kidding me. Okay, if I lose, I turn to stone, because yes, when you lose, you turn to stone because he believes so much in Jankin that he has to die if he loses. But if the enemy loses, he detaches his head and attacks with it. Okay, first off, bullshit. Second off, how much sake were the developers drinking when they came up with that? We will get to the sake hallucinations that is the art of this game a little later. Remember when I said there was an item shop in the game? Yeah, well, it's one of those item shops that seems cool in theory, 
but in practice you will never use it because while the punch is crappy, it's still the weapon you will have with you all the time. And once you get used to it and save hundreds of times, you can get fairly adept at killing these cute little lobsters. But I don't want to kill cute lobsters! Stop being a wimp, Lots, and kill! Really, the only item I found of any worth in this game is the fire ring, and these can be found in the game world for free! Some of the items are just weird, like this Evil Dead style mini-me launcher that overwhelms enemies with a bonsai charge of mini Alex kids. Okay, maybe it's not sake, maybe it's acid or some kind of magic mushroom. The enemies are all rather annoying to hit, but by far the most annoying of the lot is the Shy Guy wannabe aka The Wizard. He is invulnerable because why wouldn't he be invulnerable? and he can be triggered if you step over his block. You impinged on his safe space, so he's totally right in getting violent. He will chase you about until you leave the screen, and he gets over the emotional trauma of his safe space getting invaded. Then you got the vehicles, and on paper they look cool, but in the game they just serve to get you killed faster. Despite his rather, shall we say, outlandish appearance, Alex Kidd here belongs to the Hell's Angels OMG, and likes to ride his motorbike where he he likes. So you go out tooling for fat bottom girls, but alas, none are to be found. But death is a lot of death. When you ride on the bike, which you like, you zoom along at about 200 miles per hour and promptly crash and then die. And may the great space dragon saver preserve you if you make it any distance and get close to a boss, as you will hit the boss, get knocked off, and then die. The pedal copter is not much better, as the thing must be made of rice paper and pocky, as when you collide with obstacles only a couple of times, it breaks, and you then fall to your death more often than not. The copter is rather difficult to steer, as you have to constantly hit the button to stay in the air. And then in one level, you get a boat. Take a good hard look, as we are sailing on a boat! Well, that escalated quickly. Really, as far as the vehicles are concerned, you get two seconds worth of childlike glee and then reality comes crashing down in on you to remind you of just how cold and heartless the world truly is. Well, that was certainly emo. That's what this game does to you if you're not careful. One last note on the levels. Sometimes it out and out tricks you. You go into this evil castle here, these spikes come down and you think, you think, like any other game, you could jump on these obvious looking platforms. Go ahead, do it! Did you honestly expect anything else from this game? Yeah, if you jump on these obvious platforms, you die. Instead, you have to do the oh-so-intelligent thing of jumping in between the spikes. Moving on from the gameplay, we have the music and sound. The music is decent enough, but none of the tracks are nearly as memorable as the ones from Mario. Here, of course, is the all-important title theme. It's not a bad song, it's just a little too indistinct, and does not flow all that well, and to me at least, it becomes a little bit grating. Really, despite not liking the Jankin boss fights, the music for them sounds fairly good. The rest of the game sounds decent enough, but the various beeps and boops and bloops to me at least, are far more grating than those seen in the Mario series, although one can see some similarities between them and the later Sonic series. Now it's time to down some more sake, eat another magic mushroom, and take a look at the art style and the story. So you want to take down the big end, do you? You want to dethrone that magic plumber who prints money. Well, if you wanted to do that, perhaps you shouldn't have had the first screen of the game be your super character stuffing his face with the rice ball. And really, what is this? What is Alex Kidd supposed to be anyway? Sure, Santa Sonic Jackson is just some kind of weird design, but at least he's pleasing to the eye, and if you're told he's a hedgehog, you can go with it. Here you have Alex Kidd. Who is this guy with his Monkey King-like face and red tracksuit? He actually kind of looks a bit like Mork from Orc. Okay, now I get the mental image of a green-painted Robin Williams screaming Scottish obscenities at Imperial Guardsmen. He doesn't look cool or anything positive. Really, poor old Alex Kidd here just looks like some random guy in a tracksuit that likes to shove rice balls down his gaping mob. 
The rest of the game has some rather questionable art designs, like the various enemies. Some look totally harmless. Then you have the bosses. Well, I know what's going to be in my nightmares this week. It's just so incongruous to the rest of the game when you have a protagonist like this and a boss like this. He looks like he should be in a bloody splatter house. And all the various minions are this ugly. Just what kind of magic mushroom for the devs on when they came up with this stuff? So the game, unlike Super Mario Bros., actually has a story. And while it is more or less the same as the theoretical story for Super Mario Bros., there are story cutscenes in the game, and it does give you that much more context for what you're doing. Alex Kidd here is a prince, and he must save the land from evil villain AA23. This of course makes him look like an asshole when he voluntarily turns to stone after losing a Janikin match. Needing to save your people from a cruel and evil ruler is no excuse for breaking the sacred and immutable rules of Janikin. Just imagine if bloody Robin Hood wagered his status as a noble in some dice game and lost, and thus voluntarily became a serf, thus dooming all of Nottingham to the cruelties of servitude. That, of course, would make zero sense whatsoever. It would make Robin Hood look like a complete ponce and or tosser, whichever one you like. Now, I know I sound like I hate this game, and the reality is, I don't hate this game. I was just massively disappointed by it. I went into this game wanting to like it. I wanted to give it a fair shake, and I did just that. What you're seeing is my actual reaction to the game and its various issues. I actually wanted it to be better than SMB. I wanted it to be a long forgotten classic that I would come to love. But sadly, having played the game, I can see why Mr. Needle Mouse became Sega's mascot. Sonic is more pleasing to the eye and is instantly recognizable. His game was much more straightforward and overall he was just that much more marketable. If you grew up with Alex Kidd and love the game, then good. I do not want you to think that I'm attacking you or your fandom. If I grew up with this game, odds are I would still hate it, as I would have never been able to actually get anywhere in it. But I would have had a more positive disposition to it. So in the end, it's easy to see why Mr. Needle Mouse easily replaced Alex Kidd as Sega's main mascot. So do I actually recommend playing the game? Well, if it looks good to you right now, I have a feeling you're going to be very disappointed when you actually play it. If you grew up with it, I can understand why you still like it, but please keep in mind, no offense. Ultimately, Alex Kidd would be forgotten, and only the hardest of the hardcore gamers even though he exists. And so, I am Jitterlots, wishing you good Crash Bandicoot, and wishing you good Spyro the Dragon, or whatever makes you happy. If you enjoyed my review of Alex Kidd in Miracle World, please consider subscribing, and if you can, please consider supporting me on Patreon so that I can continue to bring you these great reviews.